Um, can you call the roll? Ms. Present. Present. Coconella? Yeah. Awful. Here. Kersley? Present. Whitlow? Here. Call the meeting to order. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda?
well, State, State Highway 2, yep, and State Police and um, City of Watsika Police and Mayor All Hands and the Health Department and, and Mental Health and everybody. I mean, the list goes on and on. So we, we had those meetings every day from at 8 a.m. and at 5 p.m. Um, so at one of the meetings that morning, Mayor Al Hans asked if I would come to city council meeting that night because he had been made aware that there were a lot of public that were, was going to be there. And they were concerned about mold, so he asked me to come in and talk a little bit about the mold issue. He had, when I got there, I was a little shy. I had to do a little more speaking about other things, but that, 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 that that's okay. So what we did was we gathered CDC mold information and mold mitigation information from the state and printed it out and had lots of different pamphlets and, and stuff available for people there at that meeting. Um, obviously, Terry, I'll go into this more, more detail. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> but the environmental health staff is very busy doing food establishment inspections for reopenings for people, you know, businesses that were flooded. Um, they had to check the Red Cross shelter. Um, we're offering free water well sampling during the month of March, and I'm going to extend that if needed. We're, we're very concerned that groundwater got into people's wells, and um, some of those well samples have come back um, with E. coli. One of my nine communities has E. coli. Yeah. yeah. So we're not talking city water. We're talking private wells. but. We need to make people as safe as we can because we know that E. coli can turn into um, a stuck infection, which can destroy somebody's kidneys, and they can end up on kidney dialysis. So, well, well, that well, uh, uh, the well driller blew, blew the well out and then chlorinated it. Um, and I went yesterday to collect the water samples that need to be for the check samples. There's four of them that have to be checked. I, I take it. But the minute I opened the faucet, I could still smell the chlorine in the system. So I'm hoping today they got it all out. So I can't, I mean, the minute you, I take the sample, that's the first thing the state lab does is check for chlorine. So it'd be wasting postage and people's time to mail them off. So we got to get the well cleaned out of the chlorine before we can sample it. Yeah. But well, if any of those four come back bad, then the establishment actually posts it. It's kind of like a boil order at that point. Mm -hmm. And then it goes through, it's a bottle processing game. Once they get it cleaned up, and we get two consecutive good samples, then I have to take two or three more samples the following month to see if it's cleared up. But a lot of times with the wells, like that well in particular, based on what I saw where the flood water levels were, that wellhead didn't go underwater. So that leads me to believe that there could be a well close in the area that did get go underwater that got that in it or it could be something as simple as the pitless adapter on the well isn't tight down below ground and it seeps in through that way but for some reason we got e coli in the well you know it's our job to protect our, our aquifer so um we'll stay on that material make sure that gets taken care of well, that's the main reason everyone I mean, it's free this whole month, and even if there wasn't a flood, everybody should take a water sample at least once a year. It doesn't cost you anything other than come in, pick up the bottle, and send, send, send it back in. But during a flood, it's even worse because even though your well may not have been affected, one down the road could have, and it depends on how the aquifer, the water flows through that aquifer, which direction. So, you know, just because your well is nice and safe, or you thought, yeah. it could be contaminated from person down, down the road. Yeah. And the only way to tell if you got clean water is to have a sample. Right. Thank you. We also um, participated in the multi-agency resource center. They call it, we called it the flood, we were calling it the Mark Center and the <coughs> people got confused. So we changed it to Flood Help Center, you know, out of the old Big R Warehouse next to Casey's from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. on Tuesday, the first and Friday the second. Um, we had a booth. We offered free water sample um, testing kits there as well. Um, we had mold mitigation information, and then I had nurses there um, so that we could um, sign people up for our senior services programs because senior services does have some EIS funds. Um, you've heard me talk about that before, um, emergency intervention funding so that we, that we can potentially access. So we 
we wanted to make sure that people, you know, signed up for that if, if there was a need. So we were busy doing that. And then we participated with, um, with in a material distribution. And let me tell you how, oh, just a, for a, just a second, how that came about. Um, the Red, the Salvation Army sent pallets on trucks um, of cleanup kits. Those cleanup kits were phenomenal. You got this bucket, and inside of this bucket was this handle that, big round handle that screwed together in places. And you, there was a mop head, broom heads, squeegee heads. If, if you, cleaning supplies, um, gloves, masks, everything. If you took that stuff out of the bucket, I guarantee you, there was no way you were getting it back in because that was so well packed. But they were amazing. So we had pallets and pallets of those that came in on a semi. We had pallets of stuff on the Red Cross. We had, um, we had, um, I think it's called, what's it called? River Ice Springs, Ice Springs River. I always get it backwards. The, the water place in Kentland gave, gave us um, 84 cases of water, um, all kinds of stuff. The, the Methodist Church, if you don't know Bob Sabo, the pastor at the Methodist Church, he's someone to get to know. <laughs> that man is phenomenal. He had pallets sent in from Methodist churches of, of things we gave out, personal care kits that were already bagged up. So they had a towel, a washcloth, shampoo, deodorant, all kinds of stuff in these personal care kits, hundreds of them. We had um, baby layettes, beautiful little baby blankets, and when you opened up the package, there were onesies and cloth diapers mm -hmm. and fur rags and sleepers and just, wow. and every one of them had a little crocheted coat for the baby. It was, they were gorgeous. So, so wonderful. So we had all those things that we needed to, to, to get to people. And, you know, we, we, we didn't want the mark to end up being a distribution center because we didn't want people who are very generous and very kind-hearted bringing their donations there because that gets too nutty to have that all at one place at one time. So when we heard WIQI was collecting at nine different locations throughout the county um, things from, from people who wanted to donate and were going to have a mater material distribution, it took one phone call to them. I, I, I started off calling Tim Waters. He put me in contact with Kay Burns and um, Becky Buss. Becky Pettis, and um, they're phenomenal. Um, so we decided we'd do it together in one place at one time. The WIQI staff collected two, two trailers full of things from com that community members donated. Everything from cleaning supplies to toilet paper and toilet paste and toilet paste. <laughs> Toothpaste. That's bad. <laughs> Um, don't put that in the notes, Amanda. <laughs> yeah, get me in my food paper. Um, just tons of stuff. So, so on Friday at noon, we had a big material distribution at the First Trust parking lot, um, and we served over over a hundred families. So, if you think there's the average family size is two or three people, we served probably at least 300 people. Um, so that that was a good thing. And they were, they impressed me. Our, the victims impressed me. These people waited in line all the way from the front of the parking lot up by the zone all the way down to 3rd Street. They were kind to each other. They were patient. There wasn't anybody trying to butt in the front of the line or cause problems or grab more. These people were standing in line, sharing their stories, giving each other support. It was amazing. It was an amazing experience. I mean, we all cried. I cried. I know, I know. Kay Burns balled her head off. Um, it was it was pretty phenomenal to see the community come together like that. Um, and I'll be honest with you, most of the people that we saw, they were they were flood victims. We did not have people from other counties coming down trying to sneak in line, and it just didn't happen. People were respectful of each other. It was a good event. It was a good it was a good thing. Um, Eric had a volunteer reception center set up at the unit office on Friday from 4 to 8 for spontaneous volunteers. One of the things that we were very fearful of was that you would get a lot of volunteers in who are, who are wonderful, well-meaning people, but they're not cert certified, they're not FEMA certified, they're not trained. They're, they, they, you don't want to put somebody into a situation where they're trying to help people, but they haven't been trained on what they're doing. 
So he worked very diligently to make sure that everybody had the appropriate training that they would need. Um, because we want it to be safe not only for the victim that they're helping, but we want it to be safe for the volunteer as well. Um, so Eric did a really good job with that. We had to secure a lot of personal protective equipment. So you're going to hear hearing about that in the near future. Um, so a lot went on. Yeah. And, and, and other people ought to need some of that stuff now mm -hmm. and realize that you were working to go get it. Is it well, we well, distributed it all. Yeah, right. so that's all gone. It's gone. It's gone. Because what was left over, we then took to the mark. That's fine. I just had some people ask, hey, how do you get in there that night and ask for if we can go somewhere and get We can get them. A few phone calls to the Salvation Army and we can have another pallet of cleanup. Well, there's only about four or five people that asked. And I said, you know what, I'll ask you today when I go in there. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, you know what, we can, we can help them. And they were asking about the cleanup kit. That's all they really asked. Tell them to call the health department. Got it. And we'll get it taken care of. Got it. <laughs> because I actually have had several people that said that they wanted to donate to the distribution and, and said if they, we need anything. Now, what, I, what we're telling people who have been calling the health department and want to donate is that the long-term recovery committee, which we will be a part of, is <coughs> got a, a bank account established at First Trust. And, and you remember, that's the same committee that functioned in 08 and and in 2015, yeah. And um, I don't, Carrie Bell on that committee, Bob Bird, um, Jeff Peterson, um, a lot of, of people who tend to step up in the community to help. So, um, Pastor Sabo, so they'll make sure that, that any, any of that don donation money is used appropriately. I have absolutely no doubt about that, none. Um, we're asking people that, that we've had people want to bring stuff into the health department, like used clothing. We can't take that at the health department, obvious, for obvious reasons, you know, like head lice and bed bugs and stuff, you know, we can't have that. But we have asked anybody who's willing to donate clothing to take it down to Angel's Closet in Milford. If they have food donations, to make those donations to the Methodist Church Food Pantry or the, or the Sheldon or the Martinton one. Um, so there are places that, where, that are available for people who do want to help. Um, so do you have any, any questions? I could give you more details, but that's the gist of it. Okay. So, yeah, a lot of, yeah, lot of, lot of staff. Do. The staff worked, um, many, many staff members worked around the clock, literally slept three or four hours every night. That's okay. That's what we do. That's what we're about. Um, so, um, that's your grants and contracts list. That's probably the last, this is probably the last time for at least a few months I'm going to give you a grants and contracts list because if you look at it, it's complete mm -hmm. for the moment. I can't tell you how excited I was yesterday afternoon to open iMeds and every one of our grants and contracts is now signed and has a, has a, has a, a state contract number. So we're up to date on everything. Now, we'll start writing contracts. Usually you start writing you know, grants for the next year in March, but we don't have a state budget yet, so <laughs> I don't know when that's going to happen. Last year it didn't start till June. I may have a couple months here where I don't have to write any grants, but we'll see how that goes. Trust me, even though I'm not officially writing them, I'm writing them. <laughs> um, so everything as of yesterday um, is signed. Can I copy that? Um, the ones we were waiting on was body art and control, body art control and tanning inspections. And then the other one was summer food and child and adult care food program. And those were both signed yesterday. So it would be the same piece of paper probably at least for another couple of months, so I just probably won't even bring that back mm -hmm. to you because now there's a contract number on everything that we need a contract number for. Sound good? Yep. Good. Yep. So funny that we just get a signed contract now and the grant ran from July 1st last year through June 30th. <laughs> it's just, 
<laughs> kind of funny, isn't it? <laughs> How the state works sometimes. Yeah. I mean, we knew that we would get it signed, you know, because they had approved it. That they had approved our Um, so the next thing, it really quick, is your program summary report. This is the same report we go over every month, so I'm just going to give you a few highlights from it. Maybe. Nope, got mine. <laughs> Found it. I always have to take a yellow highlighter, you know, and highlight the things I want to point out to you. So. Um, I'm not going to point out anything on Terry, Terry's list because he'll address that one himself. How about that, Terry? I'll go to Community Health, which is your second page. Something I want you to make. I wanted to make you aware that I'm aware of this because you're going to notice it. <coughs> if you look under Chlamydia for fiscal year 18, we're only a couple months into fiscal year 18, and we already have 10 cases. Last year we had 25 for the year. We're we're on that. I'm aware of it. It'll be addressed. We're on it. Um, that happens. Um, same thing with hepatitis C. Last year in FY17, we had 17 cases of hepatitis C in Iroquois County. We've had 14 just in the last couple months. That is because, not because I think that hepatitis is on at the spread, like chlamydia. Chlamydia spread, okay? Hepatitis C, what I think is happening here is doctors are having, they're more aware that, um, that of the prevalence and they're having more people tested. So I don't think these are, I think these are newly diagnosed cases, but I don't think that these are all acute cases. I think these are chronic cases where people are carriers. So I wanted to make you aware of that. Right. You're going to have more. Right. Yeah, exactly. And then you notice last year we we did not have any um, influenza ICU admits. One in 2017. We've had four in New York County so far. But we know it's a bad flu year. You heard me talk last month about that. Right. Uh, does it count if, if a patient goes through an IMH and then gets sent on elsewhere if one of your cases? Only if they end up in ICU. Only if they're classified. So if they do the ICU, I'm asking because I know I'm one of these cases. Mm -hmm. So if that case comes into ICU and they determine that it's influenza and then the patient decides, you know what, I'm going to go elsewhere, is that, that goes on your Yes. Address. Yes. Address. If anyone who lives in Iroquois County with an Iroquois County address okay. is admitted into intensive care unit anywhere in the state of Illinois, that, 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 that's our case. That case would get transferred from the health from the health department in the county in which they're being served to their home county. Yeah, yeah. And then on the next page, the one thing that I wanted to point out, there's just one more thing I wanted to point out to you. If you look at our new APS reports, that's our adult protective service reports, and remember that seniors who are age 60 and older or somebody who is disabled that's age 18 to 59, who has been abused, neglected, or exploited, um, or had fraud fraudulent activity um, against them. Um, those are those cases. We had seven. That's a, that's a high number for us yeah. in one month. We had seven. Um, we all know that not only do you, a lot of times when you have a disaster like our flood, you end up with disasters inside the disaster. You end up with a foodborne outbreak. We hope not, but it happens because people are eating places they haven't eaten before, and people are good, good world and trying to bring in food to like the shelters, and they're not cooked in a prepared kitchen by a licensed food handler who's had training. Okay, but with this APS, what happens is now think about this, guys. When people are going through flood and you're, you just lost everything you know, you're stressed out, right? That's when people hit other people. That's when um, the grandkids decide they're so broke they start stealing from grandma. Um, I mean, that, that sounds terrible, but that happens. Um, so not only do, do we have all these other workload things, but we have these things as well. So I wanted to make you aware that we are aware that when you look at this, 
I wanted to point those out, not, not just to tell you about them, but I wanted you to know when you look at these numbers, I'm aware of this, we're on it. So, any questions about your program summary report? Okay, I'm going to turn the program over to Terry, who's going to talk to you about your program summary report first, if you have questions about the environmental stuff with him. There's only one thing I'd like to bring to your attention, since we're talking about the water. If uh, you look at the water samples, in 2016, 24% of the samples tested unsatisfactory. Last year, they, it was 20%. That's been holding about the average. It holds in the mid-20s to the upper 20s. Uh, if you use that same figure for like last year, 20%, there's 10 of us in the room right now. Two of us would be, if we were all well, two of us would be bad, unsatisfactory. So there is a need. Everybody needs to check their well. Currently, we're running 12%. I'm afraid I have to go up after the flood mm -hmm. as we start getting the samples in. So next month, when we get, get gives you the report, that should show some higher figures. Um, I'm actually concerned that people aren't sampling after the flood. Mm -hmm. Very few samples have come in. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the past, we've done tons, but just I don't know, understand why people aren't mm -hmm. sampling them well. Should be done. Especially mm -hmm. when we're doing authentic for free right now. Right. Okay. okay. I've got a question. Yes. Yeah. 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 Say I buy a piece of ground here somewhere in Iroquois County out in the boonies. Okay. And I dig a well. It's my well. Do I have to get it inspected? Is that a law? The, when you take out, well, when you take out your well permit, the state holds the health department to collecting the sample. And if you read the fine print when you sign your application that the well driller will give you, you're actually going to take the sample for me. Yeah. So I hold you accountable to take the sample. Now, it doesn't mean that you can go out and collect um, walk water out of the mud puddle. The state just wants a sample. We will keep providing you with sample kits. Don't think that that's what happens. <laughs> All they want is a sample back. They hold me accountable to that sample being collected. But it's it's your well. It's your private well. And you, I'll send you the sample kit. I'll tell you you should you know no, sample again or read you know, or coordinate to get a, a good yeah, sample. But nobody holds you like this twenty percent that are coming back bad. My job is to educate you to get your well cleaned up and set, set sample it again until it is cleaned up, and then once a year sample. Now, if you're just digging a well to feed cattle or hogs, if it, if it's taken out that way, then that well is exempt from the sample, but it has to be taken out that way as a non-potable supply. But a potable supply has to, I'm held accountable for the water sample. Okay, thank you. And like I said, they can put. Uh, um, a mud puddle, what, 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 what are you? Set that off the state. It doesn't matter to them. And like you said, it probably happens. Does anybody else have any questions about the report? Okay. Uh, if you take one of each one of these and pass it down, I got mine. One of each. This is Jed's fault. I do. What did he do? One, you're gonna find this very interesting. You're gonna learn something today that one, you're gonna like. Holy yeah. I had to kill a tree. Yes, you did. <laughs> and this is just a little brief of just one program. But I had to print off all this to show you what we currently do and what's coming up down the line. You will learn. <laughs> Just take the tape. I'm going to do. Is it done? My presentation does. So I do. Oh, well, we're glad to have you here. Now we can look at this thing. Okay. You want to pick me up? Put a table. Put your eyes down. Okay. I'm 
times a year unless you can waive one if you have an in-house service where take a place like the hospital I don't know how many is actually in the kitchen but they said one person to listen to Chris and I talk for four or five hours then that we could waive an inspection I don't think that's fair to the community you know to send one person down to listen, listen to it we'll make the inspection at the establishment the other way is um, if they can prove to us that they have a food manager on duty at all times well that takes about more reams of paper than I actually uh, killed here to document that the nursing home for example has some you know a food manager has to be there at all times well they could all be off at a conference so if that's the case then they have to provide food from a different source it's too much paperwork so we just do the inspection so every establishment inspected twice a year some the high-risk places we all be inspected three times a year now we also have a policy out there that um, Board of Health has passed where if I find a critical this is what I feel and that's what I'm going to get into with you know, the pretty shoot here the critical violations that is what causes food borne outbreaks not that you have enough food managers on hand that kind of helps a little bit with it but the main thing is the critical violations when we walk into an establishment they're not typically all uh, they're all unannounced there's a few that have to be because they're only open a certain days of the week or a certain cut cut couple times but 99 percent of them we walk through the door they don't know we're coming and it can be as early as seven o'clock in the morning or late late as seven o'clock at night and even on weekends we've been there to inspect in the past but the critical violations is what's going to make a person sick so we have this policy if we find a critical on that first you know the first six months you find at least one you're on the watch list if we have time we will get a second inspection in that six months then it clears july through december you get a critical again you're going to get a, you know a fourth inspection low risk places there's this couple that got four inspections in a year now we also charge if there's a repeat critical exact same violation you don't label something uh, like a spray bottle it was found in uh, January come June same thing happened it's gonna cost you 200 bucks that helps deter mm -hmm. critical violations the state holds us to on all critical violations to make sure that they're corrected either at the time we're there or we have to go back and make sure within a short period of time up to about 10 days that that violation is corrected now the one example or the one exemption would be item 45 that's your food manager that is actually written into the, the code book it's three mm -hmm. months okay <coughs> everybody kind of following me here mm -hmm. okay so when it comes to the actual inspections right last year we found 72 percent of the times we found a critical violation when we walked through the door mm -hmm. now remember critical violations what causes the foodborne outbreaks okay typically your foodborne outbreaks are associated with time and temperature mm -hmm. food's out of whack you leave it long enough it's gonna create all the spores make people sick the main way it's spread by your hands hand washing is the number one deterrent for everything you hear you hear about the influenza wash your hands when you're in the food establishment you wash your hands more bare hand contact. To let you guys know with a foodborne outbreak, we can just cover cover food poisoning. Well, with a foodborne outbreak, it's not just you know calling. People think, oh, well, you know, a bunch of people get sick, and you guys just investigate to see where it comes from. It's a lot more complicated than that. Usually, by the time we find out about a foodborne outbreak, it's it's a long enough period of time that the person's got so sick of having diarrhea that they've gone to the doctor, right? Or they're having other complications because they're going to the doctor. That's usually when we find out, and then they, they test positive for, like, say, salmonella, okay? Well, then we have to get a hold of the victim. We have to do a, a three-day food history on them before they started having problems. Well, I can't remember what I ate for lunch yesterday, okay? Trying to get these people to, to do that. We could have to, we, you know, go in and do some food sampling. We have to get 
stool samples from the descendants of the state lab. We have to start contacting all their contacts who have been sick, you know, if anybody else in the household is, and doing the same process with them. It can be a, an unbelievable amount of work um, to investigate a foodborne outbreak. Unbelievable. It would be a huge cost to the taxpayers. You know, a huge cost. So it's Terry's job to make sure that, that don't happen. happen. <laughs> so anyways, when you're here today, you know, that's it, it basically because myself and my staff did our job. We did you're not sick because we did our job. Because we work with the food establishment. I wear two hats. I wear an advisor hat, and that's when we walk in and do those inspections. They're basically advisor. Okay. Then a lot of times I have to put on my enforcer hat. If you don't do what we advise, you know, like you know, for example, if I told you uh, you had to throw some food, food food away, and you said yeah, and I, I watched it throw it in the dumpster. Well, after you thought I left, I'm still watching to make sure you didn't take it back out of the dumpster. <laughs> yes. I've got a, a question. Uh -huh. Mark Henrich set up a barbecue joint over there, four way stop, Cresma. Uh -huh. And as long as the weather's decent, he's there for the barbecue. Uh -huh. Does he fall? Does he have to be licensed? He's under the high risk category. Pardon? He's under the high risk category. So he gets inspected? At least twice a year. And if he has a critical, well, I'm sorry, at least three times a year because he's high risk. See, there's where, like, the paperwork. I'd have to do probably this thick of paperwork. If Mark's, if Mark's sick, then he's exempt. You know, like, we go to a place with the ma 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 managers. If the manager's sick, that's exempt. But if Mark decides he's going to see his grandson or granddaughter that day, and they tell me that when I'm inspection, then... That's a violation. He should have been. So we just do three inspections on him at the minimum, just like the rest of the high risk places. What if he washes his hands? He has a portable hand washing sink. He has, pardon me? Portable hand washing sink. Oh, that's right. Outside by him. If he didn't have that, we would shut him down. Right. Every place that's open is made, the minimum cut is an 885. Okay, is what the ordinance says that we can shut you down at an 885 or less. Okay, we've had places with scores late, little, little lower than that, and they're and they're still open, but they're it's like you got two days to get this pigsty cleaned up. Is the Iroquois County Fairground under your jurisdiction? Yes, we have, we're out there every so day. All the foods and places and all. We're that. out there every day. He it's them all. Just like just like with the flu. My staff was my staff or myself was out there at the church every day, and we monitored all our food places. We're still monitoring. There's three that aren't open. They couldn't open until we inspected them and gave them the approval to open. Take my word for it. It's very thorough. It checks me. And you're the easiest one because you basically didn't have anything. Yeah, but now it's the yeah. yeah. <laughs> But your little thing, yes. Yeah. That's the bigger thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people, they don't like to see us come in, but then others, they, they do. Because it's a two-way, it's a, a, a double-edged sword. The owner, let's say, doesn't want to fix stuff. The help will say, hey, Terry, you might want to look over there. <laughs> and guess what? They didn't get fixed. I had one place, D was talking about mold not too long ago. One of the... Uh, the people that work in establishment, they told my inspector, hey, you might want to pull that piece of cardboard back and look behind that. She did. And she sent, sent that made a picture. It was completely covered in black mold. Oh, my God. I had to get after the owner. He got it fixed over the weekend. Mm -hmm. Now, that mold really wasn't my jurisdiction, but I have other avenues to go. I said, well, if it's not fixed, I make, on Monday morning, I'm making a phone call to OSHA. Guess what? It was fixed. Because they know when I get after them, there's no messing around. You don't do it. I'm going to call D and say, this place needs to be closed. And, and I'm never going <laughs> to. If Terry is recommending closure, I always say yes. Because he's been doing this for 30 years. 32. 32 years. <laughs> and Terry knows that, that oh. ordinance and that 
um, the FDA food code, like the back of his hand. And and if 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 it's bad enough that Terry's calling me asking me to close the place down, I'm absolutely going to close the place down. Um, we're not, you know, we it's our job to protect people. We have got to protect people. They have have to be able to know that when they go into a restaurant, that we're doing everything we can to make sure that they're eating safe food. And with that, it's basically, I'm advising you, you need to get this, you know, I'll give them a few days. It didn't get that way overnight, so they're going to have a few days to get whatever issue has to be addressed. Now, granted, if there's no hot water in the facility, I have to shut the place down. Oh, yeah. I've done that before. There's no way around that. But typically, there's usually a way that, you know, you got a couple days to get this place cleaned up, or you, a day or two to get something fixed. And then if they don't, or they don't do the what I tell them, you know, for example, at one place that had no hot water for the three compartment sink. I said, well, just shut your coffee makers down and, and your pot machine because that's what you have to clean. But don't use it until you get that fixed. Made a phone call. I checked them about a week after because it's like, that's odd. They never called. Made a phone call to these. But see, we got to shut this place down because they didn't take my advice. They had the pot machine and all that up and going. I shut their whole establishment down. That cost that company a lot of money until they got the hot water fixed. Yeah, you can't kill bacteria with cold water. It ain't going to happen. It's their own fault. Yeah, there was their own fault. They could have kept the whole, yeah. Terry, what's 13 on the violation for some reason? What's 13? These are, these are, well, the violations that I don't have 13 on here. The reason you don't see, well, 13 isn't a violation. If you pull out this sheet here, yeah. okay. These the are, are the food. I'm not sure which 13 you're looking at. Oh, no, no, those are, those are the get number of violations. Those are the number of violations. Uh, these are what the violations are. Here's the numbers are. right here. Here's your there's, there's, 14, <laughs> there's 14 critical violations. Yeah. Okay. Now, if you look at the bottom, there's two of them, or on any of these sheets, I believe there's two that haven't been marked, and I think in the 32 years I have yet to mark an item four. If that was, I mean, what that is, that would be every cooler in the establishment being down. Then you got to shut or bring food in. Oh, in your case, at the nursing home, we'd have to be bringing food in from a di different place. Oh, just one? It says here, so one is, is about a temperature, so what is one? Item one is typically um, the most common thing we find is home canned foods in establishment or eggs off of the farm. Um, found that the other day in the establishment. <laughs> Five dozen eggs. It's like trash can. Yeah. Don't let it happen again. Um, three is, my violation is three. That is your temperature. You walk in, the two door cooler's out or the food's out of whack, that's item three. Uh, seven is cross-contamination. Got your raw chicken above your space. Well, you know, that type of thing. Um, he called me. I'll tell you the story. He called me. It's been more than a year ago. And said that he was in an establishment and they had meat gone out on the shelf and it was hamburger dripping onto their oh, chicken, oh, dripping onto their God. fish. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> You have to be frozen, but if they're thawing, and you're off, what you're asking, that could be the, or the, you also have the feds in your place. Okay, I know the feds got after, when it was Ford Iroquois, they got after a facility over in Ford County, and it's like, it really makes no sense. But they were stored, they were stored together. It's somebody looking at at the rules very, very toughly. Yes, technically they might have a problem, but yeah. I understand. They had to write a four-page report that you got to add to that. They're frozen. It's frozen. It doesn't make well, a difference. It doesn't matter. He says it doesn't matter. What was yeah. your question? Okay. In, in a freezer. <laughs> it's cross-contamination in a freezer. For example, they had, like, frozen chicken over top of the frozen peas. Frozen. Frozen. You were frozen. frozen. <laughs> it wasn't yeah, just your facility. It's a place in Ford oh, County okay. about 10 years ago. Oh. It 
it like makes no sense. They're just, no, they're just the way the inspector was. Anyway, so I don't have a problem. All right, good. Now, if you look at the, the first one here, the the typical, uh, like I said, 72 percent of the time we find critical violations just walking through the door. Okay, they're broken down 37 percent of the time in high risk establishments. 23 in the medium and 12 in uh, the low risk. And that's understandable. Your low risk, there's not that many critical violations that they're going to run into. Okay. Uh, but overall, the number one critical violation last year was item 41. Now, item 41 is either chemical, it can be numerous things. The sanitizer solution too strong, um, chemicals stored with food or uh, paper products, or the chemicals not being late, or they're not even supposed to store your pesticides with your cleaning compound. So those are the major ones for item 41. That was, for, um, and that was found overall. That was the number one violation that we found. Uh, the second was the cross contamination that we talked about followed by 20, sanitizers not being at the right concentration. Uh, that one eludes me because they have uh, chemical test kits and the, you know, one for the quaternary ammonia and one for the bleach, as well as if it's a dishwasher with temperature machine, they make these little things that heat sensitive. Uh, a lot of places do Checks. They check the coolers every day, at least shifts, and they do the set sanitizers. Those you typically don't find food out of temperature. The ones that don't do that. And the, see that was the third violation. The fourth one was um, typically it's going to be someone eating or drinking in the kitchen. Item 12. Or they're putting their bare hands on ready to eat food. That's typically what's there. So does anybody have any questions on the type of violations that we're looking for? Every inspection when we walk through the door is risk-based assessment. And that's basically on what they're making that time. You know, we're there for just a snapshot. Walk in the door and the cook's making the chili. We're going to ask that person how they make it, what the temperature they're supposed to make it to, what they're going to do with that product. <coughs> if, the, if there's a person washing dishes, we're talking with them on the proper way, you know, how, how, how do they run the machine, or if it's by a three department sink, do they know how to make the solutions up, do they know to walk, you know, they're washing the dirty dishes, and when it comes time to take the clean ones out, do they know to go wash their hands, or do we observe them washing their hands, you know. There's a lot of risk based into what we look at in the establishment. It's kind of like the fly on the wall. We're looking at you know, walls, floors, and ceilings, but we're also doing risk-based assessments, as well as they have, uh, you know, they have HACCP procedures, that's hazard analysis, critical control points. Everything that you make has that built into it, all the way down to simplicity, like I mentioned, you know, the bar could cook in the pizza, you know, the pizza. Okay, did, you know, does, at the time, did that, the bar tender wash their hands before they put the pizza in, and wash it at, you know, you know, by the time she's waiting on the customers or he, then they come back, it's time to take it out. You know, they're not really touching it, but if you ever tried to cut at a pizza, you end up kind of touching it with the side of your hand. Did you actually wash your hands? You know, typically in the bars, it's uh, washing of the dish or of the bar glasses. A lot of them don't wash them the way they're supposed to. It's wash, rinse, and sanitize. And where they get messed up is it's supposed to be the sanitizer for one minute. They go, dump, dump, dump on, on the counter. It's like, no, it's supposed to stay in that sanitized solution for at least one minute. You know, they don't do that, then, you know, you drink, you drink out of a beer glass, and then Jed comes in right after, and you're, so you're basically drinking right after. They don't, but it's just the sanitizer. Alcohol. You're hoping. <laughs> Um, if the water cools down, then you have to change it when it cools down? Or? Well, the, 
It's not really the temperature on the sanitizer. The big thing is how long it's going to last. Everything evaporates over time. Quite good. Evaporates. So if you start washing dishes at 8 o'clock and you let that water sit till 3 in the afternoon, I can almost guarantee you it's not going to have a sanitized solution in it. So you have to kind of monitor to mm -hmm. see how long it's going to last. Now you have these here for checking the sanitizer, right? Yeah, mine are handy in here. Okay. And so they will just the individuals. It's like the little. That's what these are. Little okay. okay. That's just built into that. Okay. If you look at the, so I think we got all that covered. Mm -hmm. If you look at the one that says Iroquois County Public Health on the inspection sheet. Okay. This is the current inspection sheets we use. It's a 45 line item. So there's 40, there's 45 line items that we're addressing while we're in the establishment. Um, the ones that are in red or supposed to be red on your sheet, those are the critical ones that we just talked about. Okay. There's other non-critical such as food contact surfaces being clean or non-food contact surfaces being clean. You can have an establishment that has no critical violations but is in such horrible Thank conditions you. inside mm -hmm. pigsty that we'll say you got four or five days to get this pigsty cleaned up. They don't clean it up, they're going to be closed. Like I said, stuff didn't get that way overnight. Right. My job is to try to persuade them. Let's put stuff, you know, once we get it cleaned up, why don't we start a, you know, a maintenance schedule to clean things so that this doesn't happen again. You know, I don't like writing all that has to be written. But if you look at the sheets, this is the, the first sheet where you mark the violations. The second one on this is where we have to list out what we tempt every place. You know, like in the walk-in cook -co cooler, we have to have a food tip -tip temperature, the temperature that your sanitizers, or the general comments. There's certain things the state holds me to. I have to write down at least one of those tasks that concepts that we talked about it has to be on the sheet. This is all stuff that they look at for program review. So all this has to be followed and anything else that we want to make general comments goes here. Your violations then are written out and as you can see it says corrected by immediate or next day. Remember the critical is either corrected at site or we got to come back within a short period of time. Okay. Are you a uh, a deputy sheriff? No. No. Terry's a licensed environmental health practitioner. Uh, so he has the authority to shut to shut some the ordinance. Down. Well, the way the ordinance actually is written, D is the one that has the authority. And it goes through D and me. No, so the director of environmental. Challenged, do you go to the state or do you go to the sheriff's department? The state's attorney. You Which we have. Like if, if, yes. if, if, I, if I closed your establishment down, it has to, there has to be so many days, a hearing has to be made available to you. If that hearing is made, it goes in front of D at that time. Okay, D then will hear your side of the story, hear my side of the story. And then if, I got 10 days. And then if she says, no, the health department's correct, you're still closed, you have one more out which is to ask for a hearing in front of the Board of Health. Now, I can't see it ever making it that they're going to allow you to keep going the way it is, but if, you know, if I told you to close it, but you have a right to go all the way up. The health department. If you, don't, if, if you just said, I'm going to stay open, we make one phone call to Mr. Devine. Mr. Devine then calls Derek. Derek goes and has the sheriff put a lock on the door. Okay, so Mr. Devine carries out uh, the mandate. Well, the actually Derek would. We would let well, yeah, him but know, but it's written into the ordinance. We, it's written into the ordinance that if you don't have a valid permit, the county sheriff will lock your door. Okay, that's. I, I was curious. I know was. There's authority all over the really bad guy here. <laughs> <laughs> that would be me. Yeah. We have embargo tags that we can put on some of your food. Uh -huh. 
when you put that on and there? The reason that we don't go <laughs> and lock on the door ourselves is because we don't carry a gun and somebody can pull a gun on us. Well, yeah. <laughs> so, so they, yeah, we're the bad guy and then he puts the lock on the door. <laughs> now, currently this is the inspection sheet. Mm -hmm. Currently this is the code book. Nice and thin, right? Does every food yeah. server have a book like that? It's available online. The state used to give them away. Yeah, how the do they know all the rules to follow? We tell them to go to our website. All this is posted on our website. The health department. We're one of the few that has everything in a PDF. Some of them, they're not all in a PDF. You got to look around for them. The state of Illinois also has that, this stuff available. This is the current code that we're using right now. It's seen the change. Uh, actually, if it wasn't for the state pulling everything back off of the, the desk and going all through the process, we'd be starting the new FDA code come July 1st. The actual law says that this goes in effect July 1st. The state pulled everything, so everything's in the chaos because of the state of Illinois. You got a law that says this is the code July 1st. But they don't have any enforcement. Any, well, they don't have any of the stuff though, because yeah. they pulled it. But as you can tell, we went to this thick. Okay. From there to there. Oh, and this well. has supplemental sheets. Do you okay. ever have anybody give you a rough time about this? If, if you went to go to check someone out? I've been around the block. For, this is my 32nd year. Really? You can't BS a BS. <laughs> True. I've seen it all. I've heard it all. Sure. Okay. The, the new inspection sheet is the last one. It doesn't have anything. It just says food establishment inspection report. This is what they're looking to go to. There's no guarantee this is going to be what the state code is. It is a 58 line item. It covers everything down to allergen training. Allergen training is required mm -hmm. on certain places. The new place here in town falls under the allergen training. So they're a high-risk establishment, but it's a mom-and-pop type place. You take a high-risk establishment like um, oh, Texas Roadhouse, for example. They're a chain. They're, they have it in their own rooms that they go over allergen training, so they're exempt from that violation. Yeah. Uh, they're a chain organization, so the way they wrote the law, they're exempt. Expect McDonald's and places like that? Yes. Do you really? McDonald's is a medium risk establishment. You go and there and you eat food, we inspect it. <laughs> your temporary food places. In if, Iroquois County. If you go anywhere in Iroquois County other than to a personal private home, we're supposed to inspect it. Some of the temporaries, they try to slip through. They're only hurting themselves because we go over everything. If that makes <laughs> someone sick. They probably don't have enough insurance to cut, cut, cover everything. You know, you put one person in the hospital on a foodborne outbreak for a day, I think it's what, 10, 12 grand? Yeah. My job is to make sure people don't get sick, so I'm there to help people, not hurt. Right. But the, it's going to the fifth. I can see where you'd be pretty busy fellow. <laughs> it, it's going to a 58 line item. Mm. By the time it's all said and done, it'll probably get 60. Mm. Yeah. Oh, well, that one's surprising. Yeah. Anybody have any questions? No, really the the, you know how I said the, there's 14 critical? Technically, if you look, they're not called criticals when they go forward. They're going to be called uh, risk factors and public health interventions. But if you look, there's 29 of them. And there's stuff in there, like for example, when the new code kicks in, pull the person aside, and it won't be the food manager. Everybody else is supposed to have a two hour class training. They're going to pull stuff from so me aside and say, show me how to make a bleach solution, or show me how you wash the hands properly. There's actually a question on here in, out of compliance. So it's more paperwork. I have to look for papers that they sign under the new one that they have to sign them. Even if I work in establishment, been there 32 years, there has to be a piece of paper on hand that I know if I get sick to report it to work and not come to work. So I'm going to be spending more time doing paperwork than doing risk assessment.
and government. Yeah. Government and finance when it comes to that. Yeah. Okay, anything else? Thank you, Terry. Uh -huh. That's very important. Yes, thank you very much. The old business, the new business. Somebody want to move to a Second. In favor?